St Thomas's Church. Who doesn't love a great story? That's what great films are made of, it's what great bedtimes are made of. It's just great to have a great story and today we have got such a great story for you. Now you're going to have to work with me on my imagination because it's about three things. It's about a basket and use your imagination, a baby and use your imagination even more, a river. It's all I could do. Okay. So it's about a basket, a baby and a river. What could possibly go wrong? How many times have you been walking alongside a river and your mum and dad have said, come away, come away, come away from the river, it's dangerous. Well, we've got a story today about somebody that put a baby in a basket and into a river. Don't ever try that at home. It is not a good idea. And who do you think would do such a thing, such an awful thing to a baby? Some horrible tyrants, somebody who hates babies? No. The baby's own mother. The baby's own mother. It was absolutely outrageous. Anyway, watch this space. It's a great story. Use your imagination about the baby and stick with us. You will love it. But we're meeting our church, even though you're in your own homes. I hope you're really comfortable. I hope you're enjoying yourself. But what I'd like you to do is go and get something really, really loud. The louder the better. If you can bang it, if you can blow it, if you can stamp on it, if you can shake it and it can make a noise, go and get it now because we're going to sing our praises to God before we go into our story time. You've got two seconds to go and get it. Well that was great, you made a fantastic noise then, thank you for joining in. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to the story about, do you remember? A basket and a baby and a river. The Faithful Hall of Fame, Moses. This is Moses. Hey Moses was a descendant of Joseph's brother Levi. Hey. Joseph and his brothers had many children and grandchildren who lived happily in Egypt. Eventually, a new pharaoh came to power who knew nothing of Joseph or what he had done. This pharaoh feared the Israelites because there was a great number of them living in Egypt, so he wanted to put a stop to their prosperity. Pharaoh made the Israelites slaves. He made them work long, hard hours building up Egyptian cities. But his plan didn't work, and the Israelites grew more in number and in strength. Eek. So Pharaoh made a rule that no Israelite boy would be allowed to live in Egypt. This is where Moses' story begins. You see, when Moses was born, his mother saw that he was a special baby. Hmm. And she kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer keep him a secret, she made a basket and put him in the Nile River among the reeds. Moses' sister stayed to watch what would happen to her baby brother. And soon the Pharaoh's daughter came to the edge of the river. When she saw the basket, hey. she sent her servant to get it. When she saw the baby, she felt sorry for him, uh -huh. thinking he must be an Israelite baby who wasn't supposed to live. Then Moses' sister asked the princess if she would like her to find an Israelite woman to take care of the baby. Uh -huh. So Moses' sister went and got her mother. Moses' own mother took care of him until he was old enough to live in the Pharaoh's house, where the princess adopted him as her son. And so, Moses, an Israelite boy who wasn't supposed to live, 
became the adopted grandson of the Pharaoh and lived in the palace as God prepared him for a great destiny that was only just starting to unfold. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, whichever time of day you're watching this service. First of all, our reading is from Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could not hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes, and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds of the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant's woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister said to the Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call for your nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the, ch the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the women took, oh, and took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, because he said, I drew him out of the water. Well, this service this morning is going to start with a bit of an unusual thing. I was asked by someone to start with a joke, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to do this. One, two, three. Well, those of you who are very musical, or perhaps even those of you that are tone deaf, will know that that was the music from a very famous film called The Great Escape. And today we're continuing with the, con the concept and the idea of great escapes in the Bible. And that reading told us of one that we probably know very well. Now I don't know about you, but uh, during my life I can imagine I've had a, quite a number of great escapes. And I suppose you have too. I wonder if you've just missed a traffic jam by turning the, a different way down a road or you've seen an accident and been able to turn off and avoid a long hold-up. I know that when we were going through London once on the South Circular Road, we had a great escape. And Margaret will tell you this because we were driving along and we went round a roundabout and from the side of the roundabout where there was a giveaway sign for the car that was coming, he came straight out at the side of our car and it looked like it was going to be a crash, definitely a bent bodywork and maybe a lot more damage than that. But almost miraculously, our car seemed to have wheels that turned uh, sort of sideways and we went away from it and just missed it by a few inches, maybe less than a few inches even. And that to me was one of our greatest escapes. And we're grateful for that great escape. But, you know, in the Bible, we do see great escapes that are of more, much more significance. And in this story that we've just read, I believe we see at least two great escapes. First one you probably can work out, and the second one I'm sure you'll see when I explain it to you. So, what do we see here? We see a situation in which life was not very good, let alone an escape, for the children of Israel. They were in captivity to the Egyptians. I seem to get all the captivity stories because last time I preached, I preached about them being in captive in another situation. But here we see them in captive, captivity to the Egyptians. And uh, 
what happens? But uh, they are in subjection and they've got to do what Pharaoh and the Egyptians tell them to do. I'm sure they had a hard job maybe building buildings for them, maybe even the pyramids and things like that they were involved in. But here we have this not very good situation in the time of their life. And Moses comes along at an even worse time because his mother has him just when Pharaoh decides in one of his neurotic periods that he's a danger from Hebrew men that they might form themselves into an army they might get a leader they might rise up against them so he says doing things in the way they did them in those days every male Hebrew child was to be put to death not the females they weren't so much of a problem uh, maybe you might not agree with that but in this situation all the male children were to be put to death and that's the situation that um, Moses gets born into and you know we know that Moses was going to be a very important figure for the Israelites not only was he going to be able to in the long run lead them out of Egypt and lead them into the wilderness but he was going to be in close proximity to God and, uh, and hear his voice and he was going to be able to get them their laws and all their situation and although he didn't bring them back into uh, their own country again into the promised land he did take them almost to the threshold of it didn't he before he died so Moses was going to be an exceptional person for the life of the Hebrew people and he's also his life is going to teach us a lot about how God deals with uh, the world and how he deals with his people and how we can be closer to him and the story of Moses does show, doesn't it, very clearly that God does intervene into the situation that mankind finds itself in. That God doesn't uh, stand in the background and watch misfortune. That he in fact loves each one of us. That he cares for us. That he makes plan and provision for his people. And that... Um, he has made, he makes great preparations and um, has his hand very firmly in our life. And that's clearly shown, isn't it, in this story as we look at the various stages of it. In fact, can't we say that as Christians, that we know that we do not stand alone in this world. There might be many difficulties that we have. We might be in the middle of a pandemic. We might not know whether we can go on holiday to Spain or find ourselves in lockdown if we come when we come back we might not know from one minute to the next where there might be a, an out uh, a further flare-up of Covid we might be in that situation but we do know that God loves us and he does care for us and he does provide in so many ways we don't stand alone he is with us and in chapter 2 in this chapter 2 we see God's hand in a very strong way. And um, as we look at the situation, we can see that things from the very start aren't very positive, but they certainly do change. Uh, Moses is born, and his parents feel that he's a special child. We're told in certain versions of the Bible it says, face shone and that he was a beautiful child well it, it, it's a good job that God doesn't look upon just beautiful people today <laughs> because I wouldn't certainly have a look in but in that period of history they believe that the sort of favor of God could be seen in the sort of nature and um, look of a baby and a, and a person and Moses parents believed firmly that they wanted him not to go, be put to death as they, uh, Pharaoh would have had for all male children but that they wanted to look after him and for three months they managed to look after him without any issues after about three months it probably was becoming very difficult to uh, not reveal that they had a male child and um, 
they decided that they would have to take up a different way. But this next way was pretty risky, wasn't it? It wasn't an easy step to make. Um, <laughs> as a child, uh, I don't think I was, as a young man, I don't think I understood quite what was going on here because they decide that they're going to put him, uh, make a basket for him and cork it so that it's not going to sink and put him in the river Nile. Now that seems a fairly dangerous thing to do but as we think about it it's even more dangerous than it looks at first sight. I know it was in the bulrushes but the river was a a fast flowing river in places it could have swept the child away and he could have drowned and uh, oh, maybe he wouldn't have been even if he hadn't been swept away maybe he wouldn't have been found and he would have starved to death and um, maybe on the other hand something that uh, was even worse the Nile was quite famous for having loads of crocodiles and having watched a James Bond film lately in which James Bond was put in a sort of an island and was surrounded by crocodiles um, I, I, I must admit that's about the last thing I would ever want to be is in a river with crocodiles they are not friendly for people to have with you so if, if all those other things happened maybe the crocodiles would have, would have got him and then even if he'd been found if he'd been found by the Hebrews or the, the, the Egyptians the likelihood is he would have been put to death because that was exactly what uh, Pharaoh had ordered and people were m more than likely going to do what Pharaoh said. So it's a really precarious position and to escape from that would seem to be you know heads you win and tails you sorry heads you lose and tails you lose as well or ju you know just the same you weren't going to win in any situation but you know God has a wonderful way of changing the odds when God is in control and he uh, sees the problems of people that are being loyal and faithful to him he finds a way and the way he finds is quite an unusual one isn't it and um, as I say God certainly does have a way of doing wonderful things and uh, often the things that he does is far and above we could ever expect God surpasses our imagination and our desires by ten hundred a thousand fold he just doesn't do good things he does wonderful things and in this situation we see that happening very very much and uh, what does happen is of course Miriam is there his uh, sister looking at what was going to happen and uh, it's said that she was there not to do anything but just to observe what would happen and what does happen well one of the things that you might not want to happen is a load of Egyptians come along and they're not just any old Egyptians it's the Pharaoh's daughter and her entourage who are coming down to the river to bathe, maybe for a ceremonial situation, don't know what. And what do they do? They find Moses there. What, what would you expect them to do? Well, I would expect them, because it was Pharaoh's daughter, to obey Pharaoh and bow, bang, there's Moses gone. But it's not like that at all. This princess is just the right person to come along. And you know, isn't it true in our Christian lives that sometimes we feel that uh, we need help and God needs to provide it. And it comes from the last source that we would ever expect it to come from. It doesn't come from friends and family and uh, people that we know to be generous and helpful and good and kind but it comes from people that we might not even know people that we don't rate at all as being uh, the sort of people who would help but this is exactly what God does he knows the hearts of us all and 
Pharaoh's daughter comes along and wants not only to kill the child but to look after it. And of course, who's there as well? There's his sister who said, I know someone who could look after it, the child for you. And um, that's of course Moses' own mother. So Moses' mother and father had sacrificially put Moses in the river, handing him over to God, and God had handed him back to him then. Now, who would ever expect that to have happened? <laughs> no one I would expect. Not even the best crime writer in Britain could have thought of a tale like that. And the, um, the, the, the what happens, of course, is Moses now goes back to his family, and in his formative re years, they would have taught him about God, they would have taught him about the, the ways of Jehovah, and he would maybe have realized who had saved him from that situation. Now, isn't that amazing? Now, I wonder if as we look at that story, that, the, that we think that the, these things are not for us. These are great things that God does, but he never does them with us. Well, that's not true. Because although maybe we might not become Moseses, maybe we won't lead our people out of uh, trouble, and maybe we won't bring laws to them, maybe we won't take them to a promised land. But it wasn't just Moses that shows God's power in this, this story, but it's the other, what we might say, supporting cast. Just think of them, mum and dad. They had the faith to hold on to that child, even though it was dangerous to do so. They knew that God wanted something to happen. And they put themselves at danger to do that. And then when they got an attachment of the child, they give him to God again. What a sacrifice. But that sacrifice didn't become, in fact, one that they lost. They gained back and saw God's glory and benefit through it. No, things like that can happen to us. Miriam, the sister, what was she? She was a wonderful link between Pharaoh's daughter and Moses' own mum, real mum. And uh, that was a wonderful link to have. She was in the right place at the right time with the right connections. <laughs> so often God puts us in <coughs> the right place at the right time with the right people. But Miriam had to be brave enough and committed enough to know what to do and know what to say. And she did. And I wonder about us as we live our lives day by day, particularly perhaps in this COVID period, where there's people that are at a loss to know what the answer to life is, to those who are more willing to listen to what the gospel has to say to those who have never stepped in church but have visited it by virtual means. Maybe that's the situation that we should feel ourselves in, to be Miriams that can lead, can be that link, can say that just word. Mm, you don't have to preach the whole gospel, but you just need to be that link, to put them in touch with help, to put them in touch with someone who does have the ability to speak to them. We need to be that link. We need to be Miriams in the world that we live in. And then there's the Egyptian princess herself, someone who comes from the most unlikely stable for those who are going to be a part of God's plan. Maybe there's so many of us that are good at all sorts of things, but we can also be part of God's plan in a wonderful way if we accept his will and love in our lives, if we trust him, if we feel that we want to walk with him, and if we want to respond to his leading in our lives. Let's be encouraged by this story of Moses. Let each one of us feel that we can be um, in God's power and in God's way, something that will change situations and change them for the better. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you 
for the story of Moses and his great escape from that uh, Pharaoh's uh, uh, condemnation of the old book that male children should die for the way that you allowed him to be brought up by his family in the ways of his community or in the Hebrew way so that he'd be close to you Lord we just thank you for this picture of how we can live our lives how we can play a part in other people's blessings we, Lord, we want to be used by you in whatever way you want. And we pray that we will just open ourselves now to you and your leading. In your name we pray. Amen. Welcome now to our time of prayer. Let us just relax and be comfortable in the presence of God with our open hearts, minds and hands as if we're ready to receive God. Before we go into our prayers, I'd just like to read you a poem. It's called An Unlit Candle, and it's by Flora Larson. Like an unlit candle, that's how I feel today, Lord. The scene is set, the possibilities are there, but I need a spark to make me a light. A candle can't light itself. It's a helpless, lonely object, a parody of what it might be until touched by a flickering match, a glowing taper, or a flash of fire. Then the candle lives and shines, fulfilling its mission. Sincerely beautiful, in its usefulness. Lord, I need your divine spark to light the candle in my heart today, to create a flame that will burn and throb and bring to life. That which seems dead within me for a moment, I stand, Lord, mute and helpless as an unlit candle awaits to be touched by your fire to set it ablaze. Do it now, Lord. Do it now. Today, we will be looking at mercy, grace, our soul and healing. Lord, we want to live in a present moment to live as if this was the last days of our life. We want to use every moment for the greater glory of God, to use every circumstance for the benefit of our merciful God. We want to look upon everything from the point of view that nothing happens without the will of God. God of mercy, embrace the whole world and pour yourself upon everyone, everywhere, through the mercy of Jesus. Amen. Grace. Jesus, you stretched your, out your arms upon the cross. We ask you, give us the grace of following faithfully the most holy God in all things, always and everywhere. And when this will of God seems to be harsh and as difficult to fulfil, it is then we beg you, Jesus, may your power and strength flow upon us from your wounds, and may our lips keep repeating, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Compassionate Jesus, grant us the grace to forget ourselves that we may live totally for you. Helping your work of salvation according to the most holy will of God. Amen. Our soul. Father God, in whatever state the soul may be, we should pray. A soul which is pure and beautiful must pray, or else it will lose its beauty. A soul which is striving after a downfall must pray. 
or else it will never retain its strength. A soul which is newly converted must pray or else it will fall again. A sinful soul plunged in sins must pray so that it might rise again. There is no soul which is not bound to prayer, for every single grace comes to the soul through prayer. Amen. For healing. Most merciful God, we come to you in our weakness. We come to you in our fear. We come to you with trust. For you alone are our hope. We place before you the diseases of the world and we turn to you in our time of need. Bring wisdom to doctors. Give understanding to scientists. Strengthen carers with compassion and generosity. Bring healing to those who are ill. Protect those who are most at risk. Give comfort to those who have lost a loved one and welcome those who have died into your eternal home. Let us now take a minute to think of the people we know who need God's love at this time. Stabilise our communities. Unite us in our compassion. Remove all fear from our hearts. Fill us with confidence in your care. Jesus, we trust in you. Amen. Let us now say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So how fantastic is that story? How amazing is that story? A story that could have ended in absolute disaster. Who would put a baby in a basket and float them down a river and expect it to end well? So what was the difference? The difference was God was in control. And even when we think things are going disastrously wrong, God's always there. Whether we're in a river, whether we're in a birthday party, whether we're at school, whether we're at work, whether we're in the shops. If you invite God into your situation, he promises he will never leave you alone in that situation. And the outcome can only be good. So we're going to finish by thanking God for his great care and his great provision for us. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you really do care for us. You really do know whether we're in danger, whether we're in a great place, whether we're in a terrible place. But whatever place we're in, we know that if we give our lives to you, you'll be there with us and the outcome can only be good. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. Amen. So go on and have a great week. Don't forget to take God with you. And don't put any babies in any rivers. It's not good. Bye.